Viewer and listener discretion is strongly advised on today's episode. There is going to be some terminology and immature themes today that might disturb and might also upset some folks as well. All I remind everyone is that these are true horror stories and they're coming from the perspective of their respective OPs. I'm simply narrating these experiences and presenting them all to you via this podcast. I do my best to keep these completely uncensored, keep them as originally written, and I also do my best to abide by YouTube's guidelines. But there is only so much I can do on my end. I know I can't please everyone. But if you're good to tag along with me as we cover these true horror stories, then sit back, try to relax if you can, and let's get started. I was leaving my friend's house and I accidentally backed into a brick mailbox. My bike rack hit the mailbox, so my car was fine, but completely demolished said mailbox. No big deal, right? That's why we have insurance. So I went to the neighbor and told them what happened, and I gave them my insurance, phone number, as well as my name. All I got was his first name. From the get-go, this dude was creepy. He kept hitting on me, trying to date me, specifically trying to feed me. I left, and on my drive to my mom's, I'm attending at a state college, and my parents are divorced. The guy I backed into, Robert, began to text me and call me. He was insistent that it was better for both of us just to pay out of pocket for the mailbox. He sent me links to companies that could fix it for $500 and demanding I go on a date with him so I could give him the cash for the repair, and then he could feed me. I don't know what his deal with the food was, but I declined everything, but I started to get annoyed by his constant text and calls. Finally, after two days of it, with my responses only, please contact my insurance, I sent him a text saying that he was harassing me. I blocked him, but he made a new number and threatened to report it as a hit and run to the police. I'm in law school, okay? This was not a hit and run. I ended up blocking the second number. Then he used a new number to ask me if I wanted him to send a screenshot or a video of the accident to his insurance. I admit, this made me very angry. So I called this number and dug my nail so hard into my thigh, I drew blood as he threatened to report things. He asked me on a date and tried to entice me just to pay cash. I finally screamed, Don't contact me again, you inbred a piece of shit. My dad heard me and was very upset I said that to someone that I was in an accident with and that I said that to a guy who thought I was cute and just wanted a date. I blocked the third number. The next day, he reaches out again to tell me I gave him the wrong policy number. I told him I didn't. He then said it'd be easier to pay cash, that I was the problem, etc. He was talking to his insurance, I guess, and it began trying to validate my information. He had my mom's name, address, and even phone number. I verified it. I told him not to contact me again and blocked his new number. Next morning, super early, I get a text message. It's basically saying he finished the claim and I was awful for making it harder than it needed to be by going through insurance and not going on a date with him. He then included, you're so beautiful and ugly at the same time. Don't take risks, stay on a good path. Goodbye. At this point, I got scared. So I blocked the fifth number. Then at midnight he texts, You up? I know where you live. Don't try and screw me over on insurance. I'll report it as a hit and run. You honestly should have just gone on a date with me. I took the phone to my dad, showed him the text messages, and I filled him in. My dad, a pretty scary dude, then calls the guy. He answered, Shoot, I knew you were into me. Want to come over? My dad got very mad. My dad said this was beyond harassment. This was his final warning to not contact me, that we didn't care how he reported it, etc. Robert began saying I was the one that came on to him, and I offered sex as payment. 
invited him to my house, and was a horny bitch. Instantly blocked, police contacted, insurance notified, all the things. Next day, I talked to insurance, and there's a protective order filed. Then I got another text message. It told me I shouldn't have involved the police. So I blocked the seventh number. I notify police, and I go to stay at my dad's because dude doesn't have his address. My dad is a very tall, very scary dude, and he loves his second amendment. Late last night, watching Star Wars with my dad and older brother, the doorbell rings. Dad goes to see who it is, and it's Robert with a trash bag filled with various things that I left at his house, air quotations used. So, I call the police, my dad goes ballistic, of all things, police come, and they arrest the guy. As for the bag, it has lingerie, a knife, lip balm, and a Dita Von Tess fetish book, just met with an attorney. Plot twist, the guy doesn't even own the house, and he is an illegal immigrant, is married, and is being deported. I feel awful he's being deported, but I genuinely think he wanted to rape and or kill me. I go back to school in a few days, and I'm so terrified he or someone else will follow me. Also, I have kept my friend, his neighbor, informed through the whole process. He hasn't reached out to her, except for a video of me backing into the mailbox. I don't really know too many of the details on if an illegal immigrant can be charged with crimes, but he was arrested for stalking, trespassing, felony assault. He tried to push my dad and then spit at him. Insurance fraud. He lied about the accident to his insurance agent. Possession of a deadly weapon with intent. The knife in the bag and attempted breaking and entering. Really, they just kept adding on the charges. I'm staying at my friend's house for the weekend to spend time with him while he's back from college. He currently lives with his family, mom, dad, and younger sister. While I was using the bathroom, I looked over to the right and noticed a black square adapter plugged into the wall facing me directly. I looked closer and I noticed a black hole in the middle, sort of looking like a camera. I don't know if it's exactly a camera, or just a small hidden LED light to show if something is charging, but I then noticed it was connected to a cord leading to what looks like a white charging block, but I honestly don't know what it could be. If it's a camera, it definitely caught me staring at it and taking photos, so I am a bit nervous. Plus, I'm female. It's scary to think that someone could be recording me and could be posting it online for some money. I know he's not the type of person to stalk on somebody, but also he hasn't even been home for that long, so I think it might be his father's. I want to bring it up and ask about it, but I want to make sure that I'm not overreacting. I have photos of the adapter if anyone is interested in helping. I'll gladly send photos to help. Update 1 the following day. Wow, I was not expecting this much help. Thank you so much. I'm currently still here at his house and waiting for my roommate to pick me up to take me home. I currently don't have a car. If I did, I'd be gone by now. But she's aware of the situation and is just as interested as me and also scared. I do, however, have one issue. When I woke up to use the bathroom, I passed by his father slash mother's room, and I noticed what looks like a frantically thrown around room with cords all over the bed. I might just be overlooking, and this could be someone looking for their charger, but again I felt it was important to say this, to answer some questions. Yes, the back of the adapter had a weird set of numbers with power adapter model S3 on top of it. When I put those words onto Google, it did come up recommended for search for cameras. So again, I don't know if I'm just overlooking everything simply because I'm paranoid, but if any of you saw that and know what it means, please let me know. Thank you. Another question slash misunderstanding. It was in the bathroom facing directly to the side of me, but did show the whole shower, meaning if this is a camera, well, it's been recording people taking showers, 
not just taking shits. Now here's some back information on the family. My friend that I've known for a long time is gay, and there's mostly women in this house all the time when my friend isn't here in college. Unless he's snooping on his father, but I really doubt it. But I honestly think it's more likely the father. He does give me weird vibes. And as for the younger sister, I think she's 15 years old. So if this is a camera, I would be infuriated. Yes, because I was recorded, but the moment I see others were, especially the younger sister, I won't be able to shut my mouth when it comes to confrontation. And yes, the family knew ahead of time I was visiting, if this helps. I don't have an Android phone, but my mom does, so I'll most likely use hers and see if I can detect the camera. Lastly, when I took the adapter, I also took the cords connected to it, and the white block connected to the cord as well. Feel free to message me if you have any more questions. I'll try to update as much as I can, but I noticed the thread is locked, which I don't understand. I'm not new to Reddit, but this is the first time I posted something serious. But again, thank you. It means a lot that people care, and I'll update once I get home. It may take a while since I'm going to be running errands before going home, but I'll update you all in a bit. Thank you. Update number two. I finally left, and guys, it is a camera. I took off the sticker on the back of the adapter, and there's an SD card there. When I popped out the SD card, where there's an A written on it, and it's 32 gigabytes as well. I'm freaked out, and I told my friend, and he's just in so much distress. He's actually scared. I told him everything, including how I posted it on Reddit. Him and his mother want to see what's on it, and take it to the police. Update 3 Hey everyone, I'm sorry for the late reply, but I have some important information. So yes, we found proof of it being a camera, and saw the footage on the camera with an SD reader you plug into your phone. I told my friend, and he decided to tell his mother to ask on what to do, and she was completely distraught. She immediately contacted a friend who happens to be a lawyer for some advice, and she advised we take it to authorities, and we are planning to do so. But while browsing the footage, we noticed it wasn't anything too revealing. And yes, I know it's still illegal to record anyone without their permission or knowledge, but it still helped us deal with everything a bit better. My friend decided to confront his father about it, but he admits a friend from his job loaned it to him a year ago, but quickly quit the company after suing said company after an injury, and so then fleeing the country after receiving his money. Now we're currently trying to find a proof that this exchange ever happened, and it could actually be this man knowingly giving an older man with a younger daughter and son a hidden camera to capture them and maybe sell them online. Allegedly, in theory. Don't come for me, please. Now as for what's on the card, was one folder that had the videos, but there was a WhatsApp folder that was empty, which was weird. A lot of it was black just showing the candle burning all day, but it did capture people using the bathroom. I try to keep updating as I go, but it's a lot to uncover even for me. I'm still in denial about this, so I'm just going on my own pace, as well as my friend's family too. My friend said his dad was really upset once he was told his daughter, wife, and son were possibly recorded. So, I don't know. Take that as you will. Hey everybody, I tried posting this story before but not much luck, so I'm going to try to get it up here. For context, I'm from a small town that houses three different elementary schools, and only one middle school and high school, which is connected by the gymnasium and a tunnel between the two buildings. I lived there my entire life, and I went to a different school than most other people mentioned in this story. Back when I was in middle school, I had a litany of bullies who loved making every moment of my day a living hell. They did pretty much everything you could think of, ranging from pranks in the middle of class to downright physical assault. But all of them were nothing compared to this one girl I met at the beginning of 7th grade, whom we're going to call Sadie. Sadie was a stereotypical mean girl in every sense of the word. 
She loved fashion, had a gaggle of friends willing to do her bidding, and every guy was into her or wanted her. She was the kid with the highest amount of detentions. She argued a lot with the teachers, and the principal pretty much did nothing about her actions. And she made a habit of having fun with some specific kids, which included me. I was a plus-sized kid, a scaredy cat, gullible, and a bit of a pushover. But I did try to do well in school and kept to myself, but that didn't do much. As soon as Sadie took notice of me, she took it upon herself to make sure every time we even saw each other, she'd make me miserable. At the beginning, it wasn't anything much. She started rumors about me, talked shit about me online. I didn't have social media yet, so I didn't find that out until later. There were also rumors in school, and she threw things at me that ranged from her garbage to one of her textbooks. It wasn't terrible at first. Sadie was annoying, sure, but I had workarounds, so I just ignored her. But when other kids saw that I wasn't going to fight back, they joined in and took things way too far. Almost daily, I had been chased in the halls, ganged up on in the bathrooms, had my food stolen, got and blamed by the teachers for their dumb actions in class, and many other things as well. These kids had me on the edge and feeling practically worthless for the entire school year. It was to the point of me considering just running away to avoid the hell of going back to school. But why didn't I tell the school, you might ask? Well, I tried. I tried dozens of times. But teachers, guidance counselors, even the principal, they didn't care. The school was honestly not the best and they were pretty negligent to everything that didn't involve funds, sports events, and a GPA for the year. So they gave no heed to me when I tried to tell them what was going on with Sadie and her lackeys. These are some of their real responses from incidents that happened. When I'd gotten my backpack thrown down the stairs, and a calculator inside that I brought from home got broken, they said, It's your property, therefore it's your problem. When Sadie had written a fat joke alongside a slur on my locker door in permanent marker, they said, You have no evidence that it was her. When Sadie's boy toy and his friends cornered me outside the changing rooms for the gym to ask me something, they said, They were probably just kidding around. All of them spearheaded by Sadie, who was practically in charge that year, and nothing she did was getting her in trouble. Summer could not come fast enough that year. By the time 7th grade was over, they let those kids get away with so much. I honestly just gave up on trying to get outside help at that point. As I got some personal help that summer, I decided that things would be different by the time I had to go back to school for the following year. I was not going to be Sadie's personal punching bag anymore. When 8th grade started up, I was ready. I learned MMA self-defense. I defended myself vocally, I wasn't so quiet anymore, and I fought back. And it actually worked. None of the old bullies from last year even looked my way again. Except of course for Sadie, who still tried to pull her usual stunts. But the longer I showed her I didn't care, the more it pissed her off. Honestly, it felt like ample revenge to all the shit she put me through last year. Sadie, however, would not let go for the life of her. I didn't know it then, but this whole act of hers would end up taking a really bad turn. One day, I was walking to the gym, with Sadie following close behind me. She did not share a gym class with me, but she did like following me around in between classes and trying to get a rise out of me. This day, however, was not really great for me. I don't exactly remember why now, but I was stressed out, and I kept getting pissed off over whatever went wrong that day. Sadie, following behind, trying out different insults and comments about me, sent me over the edge. In a quick motion, I stopped walking, spun around, pushed Sadie backwards, and I spit towards her, with it landing on her leg. I told her just to basically screw off and leave me alone. But I didn't know what I was really expecting her reaction to be, but it sure as hell wasn't what she did. 
Sadie just stood there frozen, staring at me. I expected her to be coughing up blood from rage, or her screaming, or anything at all. But she just stood there, as if a deer was caught in the headlights. I didn't think about it at the time, as I left for gym not long after, and eventually forgot about it. After school, I was walking across the building to head for the parking lot next to the high school building, where I was to catch the bus. Everything felt normal, until I saw Sadie not far behind me. I didn't think anything was weird of it, so I ignored it and I kept walking. That is until I noticed she was taking the same path I was to the buses. This wouldn't be odd if she actually did ride the buses at all. Sadie walked to and from school every single day. If not that, someone would come pick her up. But the carpool lot was in the opposite direction of the buses. I took a different path than my normal route around the back of the school. And I looked back to check, and yep, Sadie was taking the exact same path I was, and she stopped walking every time I looked back at her. I began picking up the pace a bit, and from behind I could hear her running to catch up to me. By the time I was nearing the bus lot, she was somewhere around a 10 feet right behind me, still jogging to follow me. I definitely did not want her to learn which bus was mine, nor did I want her to follow me home, so... I decided to fake her out. I jumped onto a different bus, much to the dismay of the driver, and a Sadie ran in after me. After she got in front of the bus driver to yell at her about something, I myself ran off and raced to my actual bus, which was all the way on the other end where this particular bus was. I got in, and the bus drove away just as Sadie got off to see where I went. The next day, I didn't see Sadie anywhere at school, not in any of the classes, not at lunch, not even after school either. I asked, but nobody knew where she went. This went on for the rest of the week. The bus incident took place on a Monday, and the disappearing act happened on Tuesday. By Thursday, I began to relax about the whole thing. I still didn't understand what Sadie was doing with the whole bus incident, but as long as she was gone, things felt okay. Until Friday afternoon came along. Like the last few days, Sadie wasn't there, so I was pretty relaxed for most of it. When the end of the school day came, I was about to walk out the front doors to the building, when something stopped me. I had a horrible feeling in my stomach. It was telling me not to go outside. I had no idea where it came from, but I thought it was just my leftover anxiety playing tricks on me. So I headed out anyway, not still twisting. The middle school and high school were all part of one connecting path system, which means we all had hallways and walkways connecting both the main middle school and the main high school buildings, with one long sidewalk path out front. The parking lot where I had to walk to my bus was on the opposite end of this long sidewalk, which ran in front of both the middle school and in front of the high school. This can make for a pretty long walk, and the doors leading into the high school often flooded with students as they make for some pretty interesting obstacles. This would all come into play when this happened. I just walked down the outside stairs to the sidewalk when I saw someone run around a corner from the building. I looked over, and it was Sadie, looking as pissed as a rabid dog, full sprinting right towards me. I bolted running faster than I ever had in my whole life, running off nothing but pure adrenaline and pure fear. Sadie was catching up quickly behind me, and all I could do was run and pray for help. I dodged between crowds of kids and just tried that to lose her somewhere in the masses, not caring at all if I bumped into people, only afraid that Sadie was still behind me. By the time I reached the buses, I didn't see her anywhere, so I stopped and nearly collapsed to catch my breath. I felt relief for only a second, until she popped out of nowhere from the side of the crowd and lunged at me. Sadie then grabbed me by the hair and backpack, swinging me around in a circle as I tried to get her off of me. She kept pulling and jerking so much, I felt my hair being ripped at some points too, but she kept going, and I screamed for help. I was kicking and punching blindly in Sadie's direction, but either nobody wanted to get involved or were too scared to break us up because there was nobody who came forward. Sadie then let go of my hair to reach for something behind her. 
and what happened next was only a miracle. My older brother was walking out of high school drinking a soda when he saw the scene and ran to help. He was the only one who knew about Sadie and recognized her when he had got into school in the mornings. He threw a soda at Sadie's head, which startled her enough to let go of me and drop whatever she was holding. I grabbed my brother and we took off of the bus, making it just before it drove off. After we found a seat, I looked back outside. What I saw still gives me the chills. Sadie was on the ground, arms pinned by a teacher, and right on the ground next to her was an open hunting knife. I knew without a doubt that it was hers, because of that sound I heard when she dropped it earlier. Next Monday, I got called down to the office, where my brother was also waiting. We got pulled into the counselor's office, where there were two police officers waiting for us. Apparently, after we ran, a high school teacher saw Sadie picking up the weapon and then apprehended her, while another person called the police. They got Sadie into interrogation, and now they needed to hear what happened from me. I practically broke down right then and there and told them everything. What Sadie did to me last year, what I almost did because of her torment, the bus incident the week prior, and what happened on the sidewalk. My brother then puts his arms around me while I just sat there, nearly sobbing my words out in the process. The police and the counselor just sat there writing down what I said, but they looked on sympathetically. One of the officers even asked me if I would like to tell my parents so they could press charges. At this point, I just wanted everything to end about this horrible situation and for it to be done. So I just told them to do whatever they wanted. I just wanted this to stop. The counselor could tell I was already upset enough, so he sent me back to class. And me and my brother made a promise to never speak of this again. Sadie ended up getting into juvie for the rest of the school year, all the way until halfway through second semester of freshman year of high school. The school also had some changes to it. Police officers were now on duty during school hours in the middle and high schools. We had stricter policies with bullying, and kids could now stay with teachers before, during, after school also if they needed to. I never saw Sadie again after that, not even in passing. I later learned from one of her old friends that after senior year she dropped out to get her GED because the incident of her police record meant college was impossible. It's been over nine years since that day on the sidewalk. I will admit, this is honestly not as bad as what other kids probably had to go through, but I still feel the trauma from that time in middle school, and especially from what Sadie did to me. After middle school, I had developed depression, severe social anxiety, and PTSD from the bullies. I can't fully blame the situation for everything, as maybe if I pushed a bit harder with the teachers and the principal, maybe this wouldn't have happened in the first place. But eventually, things did end up getting better. I just wish I could go back to my 13-year-old self that had to endure all of that to say that everything was going to be okay. I am doing better now. I'm looking into therapy. I'm in university right now, and I cannot be prouder of how far I've come. So, to the psychopath of a bully that tormented me all those years ago and almost stabbed me, let's not meet again. This happened about four years ago. I had just started working at a university hospital in the US as a nursing care tech. At the time, I was planning on going to nursing school. I've since changed my major and I've graduated and thought working in a hospital would be a great starting place for experience and it would get me a better chance at getting into nursing school at the university. But anyway, I was always a very outgoing and friendly person. I still am, and I'm not a stranger to anyone at all. I had no issues making new friends at my new job. I worked day shift, 7am to 7.30pm, 3 days a week. Our shifts always overlapped with the night shift in order to give a full report to them about the patients they would be caring for that evening. Sometimes I would have to give reports to a night shift employee by the name of Mark. Mark was always funny and outgoing, and we seemed to hit it off pretty well. I was dating someone at the time though, and Mark was married, but I always just felt like he was a cool friend to hang out with. We had previously discussed stories of going out to bars. 
One night when I was getting off of work, I had mentioned I was planning on going out to a bar the next night with a group of friends and invited him along. He was more than happy to join us. The entire time we were out there, we had a great time, and he hit it off with everyone there, despite not knowing anyone in my friends group. He never blatantly hit on me or gave any ones of indication that he was attracted to me. I just saw him as a friend, and it had always felt that way, and I found the feeling was mutual with him. Anyway, I arrived home around 2 a.m., and woke up maybe around 9 or 10 a.m. I checked my phone to find an unreasonable amount of text messages from an unknown number. This was several years ago, and I no longer have the messages, but it was something along the lines of this. I know you went out with my husband last night. I know you have a boyfriend, but you must be attracted to my husband. Otherwise, why else would you invite him out to a bar without my presence and without your boyfriend? I know my husband is attractive, and I don't always appreciate him going out with other women. Blah blah blah, I don't remember the next four paragraphs she sent me, but the one that stuck out to me was when she asked, So, are you a team player? I kindly informed her that I do have a trusting boyfriend who did not mind if I went out with male friends, and I was in no way attracted to her husband. He was not attractive whatsoever, but I didn't say that. I also told her that while I understand and respect that they have an open relationship, I am not interested in experimenting with other couples. Besides, I prefer my relationship to be monogamous. She was completely understanding and even offered to meet me up for drinks with her and her husband in the future. Now, I don't care if my new friend is a swinger, not my personal lifestyle, but hey, I don't judge. I was willing to forget the whole ordeal and look past it. Big mistake. Myself and Mark made plans to go on a double date with my boyfriend and his wife, who we'll call Helen, and that was to a dance club. All was well and we had a lot of fun bar hopping and dancing. She seemed cool enough and I learned she was a school teacher in the neighboring town. By the end of the evening, we all had our friendly goodbyes and we retreated home. Again the next morning, I woke up to a whole new set of a million text messages sent from his wife. This time, not so friendly. She was upset and went off on me claiming that I was a homewrecker and that I destroyed their marriage. She claimed that I had grabbed his hand on the way to the dance floor and put his hand on my ass, which never happened, and then claimed I grabbed his ass, which also never happened then changed her story a third time and claimed I grabbed his ass, which again, never happened either. I kindly explained to her that none of these events actually occurred. She said I obviously didn't remember any of it because I was too drunk to remember, and she said my boyfriend had to carry me out of the bar. Now, I had only had two drinks over the three hours we were out. I was never drunk or blackout, as she had put it, and I left the bar walking on my own with my boyfriend at the time and had myself a good night's sleep later that night. Either way, she wasn't having my side of the story, so I decided to let it go and stop trying to convince her otherwise, and I was planning on having a talk with Mark regarding the misconstructed issue. The next day, she posted on Facebook about how her marriage was wrecked because of me. She used my name in her Facebook status and said she was going to show up at my house and settle it. She also said she never slept, and hadn't slept in days, and it was all my fault. She then placed the blame for her failing marriage on me. For the words she used describing how she was going to settle it weren't so kind or even mature. She had no idea where I lived, so I wasn't too worried about it. She told everyone, and left me a wonderful voicemail about how she planned on pressing charges against me for molesting her husband that night. A few hours later, she left me another voicemail sobbing and apologizing to me, telling me how horrible Mark was, and how he's a jerk and really mean to her, and told me she was sorry he ever got in the way of our friendship, and she was never going to allow him to interfere with our friendship ever again. I hardly knew her, and I'd only met her once in person so I promptly deleted and blocked her on Facebook, and my boyfriend did as well. I never returned her calls, 
nor did I worry about having charges pressed, because that never happened, and her husband had agreed with me prior. Although I had stopped responding and ceased contact with her, the phone calls, however, still continued. She would call me at all hours of the day, anywhere from 6 a.m. to midnight, but I never answered. Anytime she was awake, I had no issues leaving my phone on silent, so I just ignored them thinking she would give up. She lightened up after a few days. The next time I was at work, I decided to pull him aside into the storage room to have a talk with him privately, since I didn't want co-workers to hear or get involved. I didn't think it was a big issue. I told him the issue I was having with his wife, and he apologized about it and told me he would have a talk with her, and told me he would get her to stop. Great. That is until he dropped this bombshell that would make all this make a tad more sense, but still doesn't excuse her behavior. Nearing the end of the conversation, he bluntly told me, Look, I'm sorry about everything that has happened with her, but I have to be honest with you. I want to have sex with you. I told my wife I wanted to have sex with you. She had an affair a few years ago, and recently I've just wanted some strange. She wasn't okay with it at first, but she said it was a threesome and she would be willing to settle with that. Initially, she was alright with it, but as time passed since... I told her that she got upset about it. Sorry, she's been so crazy. I was a little bit stunned, but it made everything come together a bit about why she's been so upset. So I told them I wasn't interested in him, and I also told them I didn't want to go out with him alone anymore, and I didn't want any more double dates, and that was that. Fast forward a week or so, and everything had finally calmed down. I thought it was over, and I was beginning to forget about the whole ordeal. One night, I was in bed about to go to sleep, until I got a text message from a number I didn't know. All it says was, what's up? And then there's a smiley face. I asked who it was, and whoever it was completely avoided the question. I miss you. Where are you living now? Can I come by? Hey girl, wanna hang out tonight? We haven't seen each other in forever, and it's been too long. Let me come over tonight and let's have a drink and catch up. I'm on Winchester Road coming into town, and I heard you live around here. Where are you? I can stop by on my way into town. Hey girl, I miss you, and I love you. XO, XO, when are we going to see each other? I stopped answering because he or she would never tell me who they were. The texting was constant, and the calls were even worse. The calls would come in at 2am every 10-15 to 15 minutes or so, and they would not stop until about 8 a.m. This went on for about three to four days. Around the same time, my boyfriend got a friend request from someone with no mutual friends, and she had messaged him privately over Facebook along with this request. She explained she was a new nursing student coming to the university we went to, and she was on Facebook to make new friends before she moved here from Indiana, and was researching students at our university that way she could make friends before she arrived. He thought it was innocent enough. My boyfriend was Middle Eastern and did not have a common first or last name whatsoever. He also had nothing to do with a college of nursing at the university. But he added her and they had casual conversations over Facebook about similar interests and hobbies, sports, and fun places to go around our town. All was fine and well until she started asking him inappropriate questions. Things like, What's your girlfriend like? Do you think I'm pretty? I think I'm prettier than her. I don't remember what else she sent him, but they eventually turned into sexual advances. My boyfriend wasn't comfortable with all of it and considered blocking her. And let me read it because he wasn't sure what to do. I read through all the messages, and the first thing out of my mouth was, That's Helen. He didn't believe me at first, but the way she described herself and her interests, well, they were exactly like her. Once I explained all this to him, he was convinced. She had made a fake profile with fake friends, which she had made in order for it to look real, and used Facebook pictures of one of her relatives. He confronted her about it, and she completely lost it. She started cursing at him, threatening him, telling him how she has no idea who it is he is talking about, 
and went on a long rant about how her husband beats her and she's pregnant. I guess for sympathy points. Helen was never pregnant, and Mark never beat her, as far as I could tell. He told her he was sorry she was in that position, and he eventually just gave up and blocked her. But somehow she managed to get his Gmail and university email, and once she found that, the emails ended up starting. Keep in mind, I was getting constant phone calls at the same time throughout the nights when this was happening. I mean, I was getting something like 200 plus missed calls when I woke up the following morning. Initially, the emails were threatening. Then later moved to emails looking for sympathy for a made-up pregnancy and her abusive husband and all the horrible things that he did to her. Then finally moved on to a confession about how she really was Helen and she was sorry. He never responded to any of them. Since he never sent a response to her apology email, along came once again another angry, threatening email. He didn't respond to that one either. At this point, I had enough, and I was just worn out by the entire thing. It became exhausting, and I was so tired of dealing with it. A good friend of mine is an officer in our city, and I called him and told him everything that was happening, and how bad it was escalating. I showed him all the emails, the text messages, and the phone calls. The first thing he did was call the number who had been harassing me to have them stop. She admitted it was her, that being Helen, and agreed to stop contact with me, but told my friend, Officer Walton, that she will be pressing charges against me for molestation. He explained to her that it is not possible, and no such thing as pressing charges for molestation for grabbing a grown man's ass is a thing. She was displeased, but I think having an officer call her to cease contact with myself and my boyfriend was enough to make her stop. I never heard from her since. Months went by, and everything finally went back to normal. I transferred to a different apartment within the hospital, so I would not have to work with Mark anymore. I never told anyone at work about it, but I did not wish to have any more contact with them, but I was still on the same floor despite being on a different unit. I passed through this hall one night leaving work. I had to in order to go home. It was off of work that night, but I stopped in the nurse's station to say hi and bye to some of the nurses I used to work with. There was a large note hanging in the nurse's station with the extension to security. I laughed about it and asked what in the world could have happened to need their extension in such large bold letters. Nadia. She told me that apparently Mark had left his wife while she was at work. He packed up all of his belongings and moved into an apartment in town without any notice to her, and he was planning on divorcing her as well. This did not settle well with Helen. For a few days, she came up to the unit he was working on looking for him in order to confront him about it. She only showed up on his off days for a few days, until she finally found him. She never told any of the staff who she was. She just kept coming around asking about him. They would just tell her he was off of work, and she would leave. After 9 or 10 p.m., all visitors have to check in with security with state-issued ID in order to enter the hospital. Helen had found an old pair of scrubs that belonged to Mark, and when she came up to the entrance, she told security that she had left her badge at home and she wasn't able to access the building because of it. Surprisingly, they just let her in. She then went up to the unit he was working at, and she began screaming, crying, and begging him to come home. One of the nurses called security because she was making a huge scene. When security arrived to escort her out, she threatened a suicide if he didn't come home. She ended up being admitted to the mental facility a few miles down the road. The staff had left a note up in case she showed up looking for him again. Several months later, he divorced her, graduated from nursing school, and moved back to Indiana once he found a nursing job from his hometown. I never heard from Mark or Helen ever again. Fast forward a year, I went out with my friend Officer Walton to just hang out and catch up, as we hadn't seen each other in quite a while. He mentions out of the blue, You will never ever guess who left me a voicemail just a few days ago. Helen. I was dumbfounded. What the hell did she want? She still had the number for over a year? You'd only called her once, but I guess she kept it for over a year and a half. 
He let me listen to the voicemail. She told me she was trying to divorce Mark because he was abusive and she needed to serve him a restraining order. She told him I was helping her out with it. Hell no, I was not. She said the courts had told her she needed to find an officer on her own in order to do so. My friend Officer Walton never called her back. He laughed and said that it was highly unlikely she had a restraining order because once one is in place, the county finds their own employees to take care of that matter. They do not leave it to victims to ask around or find an officer to take care of it for them. Regardless, he never called her back and we never heard from her again. So, Helen, please for the love of humanity, let's not meet. I don't want to deal with your shit again. TLDR I made friends with a married guy at work and invited him out. Wife didn't like it and offered a threesome. I declined and she continued to stalk and harass me for over the period of six months until she was finally admitted to a mental care facility. My officer friend saved the day. When I was 16 or 17, I was coming home to Brooklyn from a movie in Manhattan with my friends. I was the only one who lived in Brooklyn, so I walked home from the train alone. I was used to being out late by myself. I had a midnight curfew though, but I frequently broke it because I thought nothing bad would ever happen to me, despite an uptick of rapes and assaults in our neighborhood at the time. This night, however, I was actually slated to get home on time for once. It was the summer after I graduated high school, and I was feeling amazing. I'd had a little to drink and a little to smoke as well, and I felt like I was on top of the world. It was so hot out though, and I remember that I was wearing this long sheer cape thing with a very tight and revealing little dress underneath. Not that anything would have probably been different if I'd been wearing shorts and a t-shirt. However, because of my fun little outfit, I was feeling myself and being so stupid, taking selfies while I walked down the dark streets and listening to music with both my headphones in, not really paying attention to my surroundings. I think I even sang as I walked. I got to my building after finishing my 10 minute walk from the train and walked up the steps to our apartment. We lived in a brownstone with apartments in it and ours was on the third floor. We had a gate at the bottom of the steps which separated us from the sidewalk. I pulled down my headphones and began to fumble with my keys at the top of the steps. Just as I'd found the correct key, still humming to myself and thinking about my great night, I heard the latch on the gate clank as if it were being opened. I turned around and I saw a man standing at the gate, staring up at me. He was young, probably early 20s, wearing a gray hoodie with the hood up covering part of his face, but I could see his eyes and immediately I knew something was off since how blank yet nervous his expression was. The one hand was on the handle of the gate as if he were about to open it completely but stopped once I turned around. Somehow my fight or flight instinct didn't kick in yet, it was probably the alcohol. I cautiously calmed down. Can I help you? And he didn't respond. I looked him over more closely and realized then that his other hand, the one not on the gate, was moving fast, low, near his waist. I registered that he was touching himself. I gasped, and within milliseconds he was sprinting up the stairs behind me, reaching out his hand to grab me. My brain clicked into place, and I started screaming at the top of my lungs as I jammed my key into the door and then slammed it behind me. I ran up the stairs to my apartment, screaming for my father, not even stopping to make sure the door was locked, thinking that if he followed me upstairs, he'd soon be met by my very tall father and our very loud dogs, who slept in the bedroom right next to our apartment door. As I looked over my shoulder while tearing my way upstairs, I saw his face pressed up against the glass window still watching me, but now his eyes were furious. I ran into our apartment, still screaming to my parents to call the police. My dad went downstairs and looked around, but he was gone. The police then came anyway after my mom called and came upstairs to take my statement so they could make their report. 
The two cops who showed up asked me to describe him. I did, and they said they'd cruise around looking for him, and regardless of if he was found, a detective would call me soon to make a more detailed report. However, they never did call me. There were many more rapes and assaults that continued to take place in my neighborhood for the rest of the summer. I shudder every time I think about what would have happened if I hadn't taken out my headphones before I began unlocking my door. I don't know how long he was following me for, and as far as I know, he was never caught. From that point on, for those last few weeks before I left for college, I would call my dad and make him meet me at the train station so he could walk me home safely. Now, as an adult, I am far more cautious than I was as a teenager. I am always extra aware of my surroundings, especially at night, and I don't look at my phone while I walk home. I'll never get the image of his blank stare as he lunged towards me out of my head though. I'll never forget the feeling in the pit of my stomach as I realized that he followed me home, watching me and touching himself, and was now waiting to strike. It was like being a deer realizing it's being stalked by a tiger, because the tiger accidentally stepped onto a twig and gave itself away, right before it could pounce on its prey. Edit. Thank you all so much for the love and the well wishes. It's very appreciated. I'm glad, but also sad that this story can serve as kind of a lesson for people, especially young ones. Always be aware of your surroundings, even when you think you're in a safe place. I was literally right at my doorstep, but so close to danger. It sucks that young women have to worry about shit like this, even so close to home. We shouldn't have to. But we do. This happened a couple of months ago, December of last year. I started working a new job in the mall and had to work for most of Boxing Day. I was done at 10pm and transit seemed to have ended at 7pm. I'm a student who didn't go home for the holidays due to this job and never had to deal with holiday transit hours. I decided to call an Uber and the driver picked me up right in front of the mall. We had a casual conversation during the drive back, and he learned about where I worked and how I'm living on my own for the time being since my roommates went to their hometowns. Fast forward to the next day at work, around 6pm. The driver walks into the store and tries to strike a conversation with me, but I told him I had to get back to work. He also asked me if we could hang out later, to which I said no, and he left. At the end of that shift, 10 p.m. I walked out of the store, planning to take transit. As soon as I stepped out of the store, the driver immediately pulled up next to me and offered to give me a free ride back home. After going back and forth with me, declining and him saying it's free, I decided to walk away and caught a bus home. I was pretty overwhelmed by the fact he showed up to my workplace and then waited three hours until I was done with work to offer me a ride home. I reported this to Uber and they've notified me that they suspended this driver, provided me even with a full refund, and gave me a link to provide to the police if I plan on filing a report. Silly of me to give away information like that to a stranger, but I hope to never meet that driver again who appeared twice my age, knows who I work, and live as well. Lesson learnt, 110%. So that was the last story for today's episode. If this was the first time you joined us, then do consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell. That way you'll be notified of all the future uploads coming here to the channel. Also, make sure to leave a like rating if you enjoyed it, and leave a comment telling me what you all thought. Also, if you yourself have a scary story that you'd like to share, then send it in with my user submissions email, which appears on screen on my videos tcfnarrations at gmail.com. Now, if you're looking for more of the Creepy Fox, then check out all the other videos I got on my channel. There's so much narration content that I'm sure you're going to enjoy. I've also got some exclusive Scary Stories narration episodes. If you'd like to listen to those, then for as little as $2 a month, you can become a Creepy Fox channel member and gain access to 10 plus hours of extra additional content. I also got some cool merch which is featured down below. There's shirts, stickers, sweaters, coffee mugs, 
you name it. I got a lot of things that you might like, so check it out, see if you might find something on the Creepy Fox shop. Lastly, it's not something I really talk about or mention, but I wanted to go ahead and plug my other social media. If you wanted to follow me on my Instagram, I'm pretty active there. It's at the Creepy Fox official. You can see the name on the bottom right of all my videos. I like to post videos of my pets, specifically my dog and my birds, so if you're somebody that likes animals, then give me a follow and check out my stories. I'm always posting daily. Anyway, that is gonna go ahead and do it for today. Thank you so much everyone for watching today, and I'll go ahead and catch you all on the next episode. Until then, take care and have yourself an amazing day.